Good morning, Lakeside Hebron. It's good to see you all today and good to be back here with you. Um, If we have not yet met, my name is Nathan. I'm the planting pastor here at the church, and I haven't been here the last four Sundays because I've been down in Montgomery, Alabama, receiving my full certification as a chaplain in the United States Air Force. And so I'm part of the United States Air Force Reserves, and I mentioned this in the weekly focus. If you get the focus, you've kind of followed along my journey. If you don't get the focus, I encourage you to go out to the information desk and you can pull a card there and sign up in order to receive that weekly email. But um, I'm in the reserves. I'm stationed at Wright Patterson. But in order to be fully qualified, I had to go through an intensive four-week training in the chaplain corps. By way of what I learned, I just made a quick list. Um, I learned a lot about privilege communication, the ins and outs of spiritual fitness, the significance of religious freedom in the military, navigation of domestic violence, ways to care for for folks both post and pre-deployment, how to provide spiritual care for those with moral injury, how to officiate mass casualty situations, how to notify families when loved ones die in conflict, the importance of command advisement techniques to do spiritual counseling in high-stress situations, grief counseling, and assist suicide training in order to help identify and help those who are struggling through thoughts of suicide. It was a lot to take in in four weeks. It was, it was a very intense training, and um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you all for allowing me to serve in this unique capacity in the Air Force, for, for supporting the church here, um, the elders, for allowing me to, to kind of wear the double hats and be in the reserves as a chaplain and still be the pastor of the church here. Um, it, it's a really neat experience. I, along with 30 other chaplains, um, now have the tools in our toolbox to serve. This is a picture of the class. I was with um, just a great group of, of uh, men and, and women who are going into the chaplain corps in order to uh, serve as chaplains in the Air Force, uh, stationed literally all over the world, some in the reserves, some in the guard, and uh, some reg AF or active duty as well. And so just, just really a great and awesome opportunity. So thank you for affording me that opportunity. I really appreciate it. As much As I enjoy that, I enjoy being here with you all and picking up where Pastor Travis left off in our series titled, Liar, Lunatic, or Lord. This series is going to lead us right up to Easter, and in this series, we're zooming in on nine moments in the Gospel of John, uh, nine moments when Jesus encourages us to make a choice about who he is. Is he a liar who's deceiving people? Is he a lunatic who's absolutely lost his mind? Or is he, in fact, the Lord? This is the question that was raised when Jesus turned water to wine, when he cleansed the temple, when he spoke with the teacher, and now we shift gears as we get into John chapter 4. You can follow along in your Bible in John 4, or if you're using a smartphone, you can scan that QR code on the seat back in front of you and follow along right there on your phone. Today's account of Jesus is going to take us to the sacred well, where we meet a Samaritan woman. And this is significant because the sacred well event challenges our understanding of the word all. It it makes us think long and hard about a, a really small word we use a lot, the word all, and what that word actually means. Last week, Pastor Travis touched on all as he unpacked John 3, verses 16 through 21. In a very practical passage of Scripture, Jesus made it clear that there's one way for people to be made right with God. There's one way for all people to be made right with God, and that is through Him. But up to this point in John's account of Jesus, Jesus has not interacted with all people. Think of where we've been in this series. At the wedding feast, he reveals himself to the handful of his closest Jewish followers. In the temple cleansing event, he reveals himself to those people who are somewhat religious because they're gathered in the temple. And then last week, Jesus talked to a powerful, respected, and theologically trained person. Up to this point, Jesus is all, in terms of actual experience and practical connection, has only applied to some. To the Jews, to those who are religious, to those who are learned, to those who are powerful, to those who have some sort of stability and are respected, but that's all about to change. Jesus' actions are going to challenge just who it is that Jesus has come to save. 
He's going to challenge the thinking of his followers in John chapter 4. So let's pick up together John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. We read this. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, so Jesus isn't actually dunking under the water. His disciples are doing that. He left Judea, so he left the area of Jerusalem, and he departed again for Galilee. He left the city and he went north into the countryside and he had to, we're going to come back to this, and he had to pass through Samaria. And so he came to a town of Samaria called Sakar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, and, and I think the weariness is, is not just the, the little bit that he had traveled, but in general what he had been doing. He's, he's wearied in part by what he's done up to this point. He's sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There's a lot happening here, but first we see Jesus is moving from the city of Jerusalem to the countryside of Galilee. Why? Because there's rising prominence in Jesus' life and popularity, and it's about to cause an issue. Jesus is challenging the people to ask the question, is he liar, is he lunatic, or is he Lord? The Pharisees are thinking lunatic, and so they're thinking we need to kill this guy and get rid of him. Which causes us to ask the question, why didn't Jesus just go to the cross? I mean, that's what he's here to do, is is to die on the cross. And so the Pharisees are already getting irritated by Jesus. So why doesn't Jesus just go ahead and have the confrontation that will lead to his death? We can't know for sure. But I think there's a hint in verse 4 that says Jesus had to pass through Samaria. It's, It's one of those little verses that's meant to pop off the page and beg us to ask the question, why did Jesus have to go through Samaria? Practically speaking, Jesus did not have to go through Samaria. The path through Samaria was the shortest from Jerusalem to Galilee, but Jesus is not in any hurry. We're going to see in the passage we look at today. He's going to sit at the well. He's going to have a long conversation with a woman. He's going to end up going to her house. He's going to end up talking to a bunch of people in the town. He's going to spend several days there. So Jesus is in no hurry whatsoever. He could have easily gone around Samaria, which is what most Jewish people did. To understand this passage, we have to understand a little history, so stick with me. I'm going to give you a bit of a history lesson. Way back in 722 BC, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And at that time, they carried 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel off, and they left only the lowest of society there. These Israelites intermingled with non-Jewish people, and they created an ethnically and religiously mixed race known as the Samaritans. By the time of Jesus, the Samaritans were all that was left of the ten lost tribes of Israel. When we talk about the ten lost tribes of Israel, it's not like somebody misplaced ten tribes of people. They're lost in the sense that they're mixed in with others. And so, they're mixed in, but yet they carry ritual from the law of Moses, enough that they created their own temple. So you have the temple at Jerusalem, and the Samaritan people created their own temple temple. And they worshipped at their own temple until 128 BC. What happened at 128 BC? The Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple. So there's all kinds of bad blood here between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews despised the Samaritans. And so they would literally go around the area of Samaria. They would cross the Jordan River. They would go up and then they would go back into Galilee so that they could avoid walking through this area. Area, and yet Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why did Jesus have to go through Samaria? The need was not because of travel arrangements or practical necessities, but because there were people there who needed to meet Jesus. 
Jesus is defining the all of John chapter 3. He's vividly showing his disciples that the unschooled, those without influence, the despised, and those capable of only a heresy religion, they too have a choice to make. They too get to decide, is Jesus liar, lunatic, or Lord? Jesus has told the disciples that the choice is going to all people. Now he's going to show the disciples that the choice is going to all people. And he starts by a sacred well. He starts by a well outside of the city of Sakaar, and it's more than a coincidence. Let me give you just a little more history. This is right outside the ancient city of Shechem. So if you've read the Old Testament, you've maybe seen Shechem. By the time we get to the New Testament, it's called Sakaar. It's the same place. This is where Abraham first came when he arrived in Canaan from Babylon. This is where God first appeared to Abraham in Canaan and said that he would give the land to Abraham and his descendants. This is where Abraham built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. This is where Jacob came safely when he returned with his wives and children after being with Laban. This is where Jacob bought a piece of land for a hundred pieces of silver. This is where Jacob built an altar to the Lord and established a connection that became known as Jacob. Jacob's well. This is the plot of ground that Jacob gave to Joseph. This is where the bones of Joseph were eventually buried when they were carried out of Egypt 400 years later and brought back into Israel. They were buried in this area. This is where Joshua boldly said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's, it's not Jerusalem, but it's a very powerful place throughout the story of Israel in the Old Testament. It is second to none, and the history here is rich, and it's, it's significant, and it's about to get better. Jesus purposely chooses a spot where God has worked at various points to teach a very powerful lesson. So let's pick up in the story and see what happens. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So he's chilling by the well. He's relaxing. He sends his disciples into the city to get some sandwiches. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. So she understands, like, what, what's going on here? Why are you, a, a male and a Jew, talking to me, a Samaritan and a female? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay? Now, when we hear living water, we kind of think one thing. Um, understand that that phrase, living water, refers to moving water water. And so water in a creek is moving water. Here's why this is significant. The well there went down to an underground spring. And so a lot of wells are dug and they're just holes in the ground that are kind of like cisterns. They catch water. But this particular well had living water in it. This particular well had an underground stream in it that was always flowing. And so her mind is thinking, how are you going to get me that water down there when you don't have anything to get it with? The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw the living water with. How are you going to get down there to that spring? The well is deep. Where, did you get, where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. I think, uh, and Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. So, hey, the water in the well, the living water you're thinking of, you're going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I do not have to to be thirsty or have to come here again to draw the water. There, there's all kinds of stuff happening in this verse, these verses. I want to remind you of what Pastor Travis said last week. He said there's a pattern in the Gospel of John that we see over and over again, and we see it here. It starts with a question. The question is answered by Jesus in a way that seems very, very literal. 
It becomes extremely confusing, and then Jesus says, follow me or listen to me, and I will give you some clarity. That's the pattern we saw with the teacher last week, and it's the pattern we see here with the sacred well. The question is, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me a Samaritan for a drink? We've talked about the ethical and the religious tension between these two groups. The person who by societal standards is a woman, a Samaritan, and an outcast, she cannot figure out why Jesus is talking to her. And his answer is, if, if you knew who I was, I would give you living water. It's taken very literally. She's thinking, how does he get the water? How is he going to get down there when he has no bucket? But Jesus clarifies he's not talking about the living water that's down in the stream. He's talking about eternal life. As in the account with the teacher, this is about proximity once again. God is promising to come close to the Samaritan woman and to give her what she needs most. The thing is, she doesn't know what it is that she needs most. She believes what she needs most is not to have to come back to the well, but what she actually needs is her heart to be changed. She needs living water inside of her. And clouding this whole discussion is a very uncomfortable truth. The Samaritan woman is a moral outcast. I mentioned this in passing, but it bears thoughtful explanation. She's come to draw water at a very unusual time of day. She's there about noon. Typically, all the women would gather early in the day and late in the day to gather water. Think of it like first century version of the view. The women would get together, and they would chit-chat, and they would talk about things. But she comes at noon when there's no other women there. Why is that the case? We speculate it's the case because she did not feel welcomed in the group of ladies from the town. And so Jesus piques her curiosity. He makes her curious about the things of God by saying, if you knew the gift of God. He makes her curious about what he is saying by saying, if you knew who is speaking to you. He makes her curious by inviting her to think about the living water down in the, in the uh, stream, but also what's going on inside of her heart. Jesus is encouraging her to ask the question, is he liar, is he lunatic, or is he Lord? Is he greater as she asks, than Jacob. Some people take this question to be cynical or dismissive on the part of the Samaritan woman. It, it all depends on how you read the text. So you can read it as if she's being snarky. You can read it with a snarky tone of voice where she's like, you know, moving her head kind of like this sort of thing and saying like, well, what are you better than Jacob? Like that kind of thing, that it's just a snarky sort of tone of voice. Or it could be that she legitimately is asking. I, I tend to think she's legitimately asking. I think by this point in the conversation, she, she wants to know like, who, who are you? And are you actually better than Jacob. And, and how do I get to the point I never have to thirst again? The only issue is she's focused on physical thirst, and Jesus is talking about spiritual thirst. Jesus uses thirst as a picture of the spiritual need and longing that everyone has. This woman has tried all kinds of things to fill the thirst inside of her. She has tried all sorts of things, and, and she's not alone. People of all ages and all stages, we are thirsty for something beyond ourselves. We long for something to give us meaning and purpose. And yet Jesus says he's the one that can satisfy and quench the thirst of the soul. There's no middle ground. It's Jesus. And it's the point he's making that gets lost a little bit in the confusion about water. Drinking is an action we take like faith. Charles Spurgeon famously said, What does a thirsty man do to get rid of his thirst? He drinks. Perhaps there's no greater representation of faith in all the Word of God than that. To drink is to receive, to take the refreshment that only God can provide. It's in drinking, it's in receiving from God that the Samaritan woman can have her soul quenched. And the same is true for anyone who follows Jesus. But... There's, there's one more roadblock that has to be gotten through. So let's pick up the passage and finish the last few verses we're going to look at today. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. And the woman answered Jesus, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir... I perceive that you are a prophet. You're one that speaks on behalf of God. Our fathers worshipped on this 
mountain. Remember, they had a temple there because there's so many awesome things in the Old Testament that happened there. Our, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where the people ought to worship, which is kind of presumptuous. Jesus hasn't actually said that. She just figures he believes that because he's a Jewish person. And Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. There's a lot going on here. I want to keep us really high level so we don't miss the forest for the trees. In this back and forth dialogue, the Samaritan woman has gotten off track. She's stuck on the physical water and the well, and Jesus is trying to get her to think about the heart. Jesus does this by bringing up her lifestyle. Jesus approaches the Samaritan woman by way of her conscience, and in doing this, Jesus for forces her to make a choice. The Samaritan woman must decide what she loves more, her sin or Jesus. And it's not an easy question, especially for this woman in that culture. She has had five husbands already. The fact that she has found a guy who is letting her live with him is quite amazing, but it's not marriage. They are living together outside of marriage and it's not honoring to God. And Jesus needs her to see this before she can accept the living water. She has to admit that there's some things in her life that need to be changed. And it's easy for us on the outside looking in to say, well, isn't that obvious? Isn't it obvious that, that she needs to change some things in her life? But it's not obvious to her. And a lot of times it's not obvious to us. We talked a lot about this in all of my counseling sessions over the last month as a chaplain, that a lot of times those of us who are chaplains are a little older, a little long in the tooth. We, we meet with young airmen who are struggling, and, and their supervisor makes them come and talk to the chaplain, and, and we find out in the conversation, hey, the reason this young airman is struggling is because they're late to work every single day, and so we ask them, like, hey, why are you late to work all the time? And they say, well, it's probably because I I stay up till four in the morning every day playing video games. And we're thinking, as older people who are a little further along, well, stop it, right? Stop doing that. Like, we, we can identify the problem, but it doesn't do any good for us to identify the problem. They have to identify the problem. And so they teach us as counselors, we, we have to lead with questions and ask because until the person recognizes, you know what, maybe if I went to bed at two instead of four, I might be able to get up in the morning. Like until that clicks in someone's mind, it doesn't do any good for me to say it if someone else doesn't understand it. And that's exactly what's happening here. Jesus needs the Samaritan woman to admit that she has an issue. But instead, she switches the focus to worship. She, she's really a fascinating lady. She launches into this theological discussion with Jesus about the mountain that they're on. And the Samaritan woman wants to talk about where it is that they are supposed to be worshiping. She wants to discuss the difference between the Samaritans and the Jews and their temple and our temple. And she wants to get into this theological tirade. But Jesus is there to show her there's really no difference at all. The spiritual condition is the same. It doesn't matter if we're talking about the disciples at the wedding feast, the religious people in the temple courts, the teacher with all of his power, education, and respect, or the Samaritan woman who's a moral outcast. They all need to make a choice about who Jesus is. And they've all misunderstood on some level what worship is. See, many believe worship is about a place, and Jesus is saying it's about spirit and truth. It's not about Jerusalem. 
is not about Mount Gerizim. Worship is not about a place and its trappings. It's about spirit and truth. Worship is about spirit. It's not about the outward location or the physical. It's about what's going on in the spirit. And it's about truth, which means it is focused on the Word of God. And friends, I would contend to you that it's so easy for us to become like the Samaritan woman. We can make worship about the seat we sit in on Sunday morning, the songs we sing, how the offering time is conducted, the way we take communion or when announcements are made. And all those things can become so important to us when they are simply meant to be tools to be used for worship. They're not worship in and of themselves. Worship is not confined to this space or any other space. It's not about what we do on Sunday morning only. Worship is about spirit and it's about the truth of God that is contained in Scripture. And too often, we want to be comfortable. We want to do exactly what this woman did. We want to argue about the specifics of worship would make us comfortable instead of realizing that Jesus wants to deal with the heart. To get there, though, we have to decide if Jesus is Lord. The Samaritan woman makes this decision, and by the end of the chapter, we're told that the entire town learns about her sinfulness from her. She goes back in, and she tells everybody, hey, come check out this guy who told me everything I've done. She points people to Jesus. Jesus changes her life because he comes to her right where she is. An unschooled, without influence, despised Samaritan woman. And Jesus says, I have to go to Samaria. Jesus meets her where she is and invites her to change. There's a lot of potential takeaways. I just want to hit a couple today as we come near the end of our time together. Let me point this out. Jesus offers salvation to all. Jesus offers salvation to all. Some of you are thinking... Nathan, that's not very deep. You've been gone for a month uh, learning about chaplaincy stuff, and this is like basic level Sunday school answer. I hear you, but I also know that the greatest distance in the world is the distance from the head to the heart. These six inches can take a lifetime to travel. Many of us know in our head that Jesus offers salvation to all, but we are not convinced in our hearts. Going back to what was said in the beginning, I think this is why Jesus had to go through Samaria. He, he wasn't ready to go to the cross because if he went to the cross then, we may have walked away with the idea that Jesus only came for certain ethnicities, certain religious groups, or certain people who were educated in a certain way, but nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus meets the Samaritan woman and where she is and offers for her to accept him as Lord. I invite you to hear this today. If for any reason you are wondering whether God can love you, he can and he does. Your gender, your education, your ethnicity, your background are not barriers to the love of God. Jesus is willing to pull up a seat, to sit down by the well, and to have a conversation with you in the midst of your shame. See, it seems that the Samaritan woman is living her life in shame. She's isolated. She hopes to slip into the well and to slip out without having to interact with anyone at all. She doesn't want to see people because people remind her of how broken she is. But it's right there that Jesus shows up and meets her. And as Christians following King Jesus, this is how we are supposed to behave. We are supposed to meet people right in the midst of their brokenness and shame and sit down and have a conversation. But it isn't where the story stops. See, Lord Jesus changes lives. This is true for the Samaritan woman. For the sake of time, we didn't do the whole rest of the chapter, but this woman was forever changed after meeting King Jesus. She went into the town and she told other people about her sinfulness. We don't get all the details, but the chapter ends, or near the end of the chapter, we read this verse. It says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus. Why? Because of the woman's testimony. This woman made a significant difference in an entire town by telling her story about how Jesus met her in her place of brokenness and shame. Her life changed. She went from being a moral outcast to being the link between Jesus and an entire town of people. Jesus sought the woman and she could not help in response but to seek others. She finally came to understand the confusing, underst the confusing conversation and her heart 
was filled with the eternal love of God that would not go dry. And in boldness, she went out, even though I'm sure it was a little uncomfortable, and she told people about Jesus. She answered the question for herself. Is he liar? Is he lunatic? Or is he Lord? She decided he was Lord, and she told others that truth. Now, if Jesus is a liar or a lunatic, there's a sense in which none of this matters. But if, there's, if he's in fact Lord, then he gets a say about what goes on in our life. Notice that Jesus made her deal with her moral failings. He, he made her deal with the way she was mistreating worship. Jesus got to the heart, and it changed this woman. Which brings me to the final point I want to make today. It takes courage to love Jesus more than to love sin. It takes courage on all of our parts to love Jesus more than to love sin. I'm not talking about the courage of the tongue. In our world today, too many Christians have confused being right with loving people. We have plenty of folks around us who think that it's courageous to tell other people how they're wrong. That, that, that's not exactly what we see in this passage. What we see is not this Samaritan woman going back into the village to tell all the people in the village how they are wrong. We see this Samaritan woman going back into the village to tell all the people there, here's how I was wrong. And here's what Jesus means to me. The woman at the well is confronted by Jesus and she makes a choice to love Jesus more than sin. That means she goes back into the town. She's honest about her past. She doesn't hide. She doesn't pretend that it didn't happen. She faces the truth and she says, let me tell you about Jesus who met me right in the midst of my shame and who sat down with me and who loved me and who listened to me and who gave me living water. I want to tell you about that. That's the kind of testimony that changes people's lives. And it's the sort of thing that Jesus does. So the question's raised. Is Jesus liar, lunatic, or Lord? I believe he's Lord. And I believe he's offering us a living water that quenches the soul. But in order to get there, we have to be honest and meet Jesus right in the midst of our brokenness and shame. And allow him to begin to change our lives so that he will give us the courage we need to confront our sins. Let's take a moment and pray together. God, thank you for this amazing story. And Jesus, thank you for the choice to go through Samaria. You had to go there. We don't know the answer for sure, God. But as I read this story today, I think you had to go there to show us what it looks like to extend salvation to all. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for the account that we have in Scripture. I'm so thankful for the Samaritan woman. I'm so thankful, Jesus, that you meet us, oftentimes right in the midst of our shame, and you accept us and you love us. And so, God, I would pray for this church. I would pray for, for us as we are people of faith that sometimes we get our, our wires crossed and we get focused on worship and we get tunnel vision and we start thinking about, well, it's what happens in here on a Sunday morning and, and, and we just get kind of confused. And, God, I, I pray that you would, you would take away the things that cloud our mind and you would allow us to, to walk out of this place and walk into our homes and our neighborhoods and our places of influence and we would go there as people who are filled with the living water and we would offer that eternal life to others by meeting them right where they're at, not where we think they should be. God, thank you for your love and thank you for your grace. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.